This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. And I'm Mariana Brocious. Well, the first presidential primaries are just three months away, and I'm starting to think about what the election might mean for our climate. I don't want to go through another election cycle. I feel like at this point they are just never ending and they are so negative most of the time. And there's a lot of stuff that just kind of dominates the news cycle. Right. And divides us. And it seems like every election is the most important one of our lifetime. And yet there's a lot at stake for the climate and energy and a lot more. And with elections now come fake news and misinformation campaigns trying to sway voters on social media. Yeah, and it's actually kind of frightening how successful some of those strategies are. Just in the renewable space alone, there have been wind and solar projects delayed or even canceled because of misinformation on social media. So it's kind of amazing how much people can be swayed. And it's disturbing that a lot of the social media companies have laid off people recently that are content moderators whose job is to find out and suppress misinformation. You know, a little doubt can go a long way in keeping people clinging to fossil fuels. People are wary of change and uncertainty favors the status quo. On today's episode, I have a conversation with someone who's uniquely positioned to speak about the intersection of misinformation, artificial intelligence, and climate disruption. That's Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna. Congressman Khanna represents California's 17th district, which includes much of Silicon Valley and the first Tesla factory. And I toured that factory years ago when it was a dark, abandoned former GM and Toyota factory. A new assembly line was being installed for this little company that was just starting to make cars called Tesla. I was surprised by his comments about Tesla and unions. Tesla's status as a non-union automaker, which gives it a cost advantage, is a big factor in the UAW strike now against GM, Ford, and Stellantis. And what surprised you about his comments about Tesla? He came into office with backing from big tech executives who were known for their hostility toward labor unions. So I thought with a big factory in his district, I was a little surprised how clearly pro-union he was, taking the side of workers rather than the big company in his district. Yeah, Kana won his seat from an eight-term incumbent Democrat who was supported by California's political establishment and labor unions. So Kana is kind of known as a pragmatic progressive. He is, and that irks some people sometimes. He worked with Joe Manchin's office during negotiations for what eventually would become the Inflation Reduction Act. At that time, progressives and many Democrats were raging against Joe Manchin. Yeah, he was seemingly standing in the way of a lot of climate legislation. In 2021, Kana was chair of a subcommittee of the House Oversight Committee, and he brought some attention to the role social media platforms play in spreading disinformation about fossil fuels and clean energy. That role of social media companies doesn't get a lot of attention in the energy conversation. Images of wind turbines on fire are one example of smear campaigns on social media that sow doubt about renewables. And in fact, renewables are safe and clean. And maybe the more well-known thing he's done recently is that Khanna presided over historic hearings where big oil executives testified under oath about their company's role in climate misinformation. This was a big deal. It was a big deal. Let's hear a moment from the hearing when Congressman Khanna asked Exxon CEO Darren Woods if the company would admit that it was a mistake when a former CEO denied the link between burning fossil fuels and climate change. When I make a statement that's wrong, when most people make a statement that's wrong, they say, okay, it's a mistake, we regret it. I'm just asking you for that. You, I assume now that it's a false statement that the company regrets making it and would acknowledge that, right? I think the expectation would be that we'd, we'd look at that at the time it was said and years ago but, that was But forget, forget whether it was consistent or not. Can you just acknowledge that it was a mistake to make? If, if someone makes a mistake, just say it was a mistake. And, and you regret that that statement was out there. Would you say that? If I, I don't think it's fair to judge something 25 years ago with what we've learned since that. Well, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that you're not even willing to say that something is a mistake. I have two things to say about that. First, the basic science of greenhouse gases goes back more than a century. And famed scientist Edward Teller warned the oil industry about that in the 1950s at the 100th anniversary of the American Petroleum Institute. So Exxon knew. Totally Exxon knew. Second, to be fair, if Exxon CEO Darren Woods makes the admission Kana was seeking, the company could be legally liable. Yeah, but that's exactly the point, right? Congressman Kana and others believe big oil should be liable for the harm its products have caused. That is the point. Oil companies are trapped by decades of deceit. And that's what made these hearings so compelling and interesting. 
Well, it was historic uh, hearings, uh, similar to the big tobacco hearings. Until then, these big oil CEOs had never been brought uh, to the United States Congress to explain uh, their lies about the cause of climate change. Uh, for many, many decades, these oil companies knew that burning fossil fuels causes climate change. Their scientists have the most up-to-date science, and yet they'd have executives go out and uh, mislead the American public. So we threatened to subpoena them, and we got all of the uh, big executives in front of us and millions of documents uh, where they more or less admitted that in the past uh, they had misled the American people uh, about uh, b burning fossil fuels and the cause of climate change, and we tried to hold them accountable uh, for their statements. A lot of that, uh, the evidence that we discovered is now part of uh, efforts by activists and litigation to hold these big oil companies accountable. And there's an amazing moment in that hearing where you're going kind of for that kind of uh, nicotine is not addictive moment where you you tell the big oil CEOs they could stop funding the American Petroleum Institute's disinformation campaign. That's the Industry Association. You say, quote, you could tell them to knock it off for the sake of the planet. You could end it. You could end that lobbying. Would any of you take the opportunity to look, look at API and say, stop it? Any of you? What did you expect would happen and what happened in that moment? Well, there were crickets. I was hoping a few of them would at least say, yes, we agree with you. A a API shouldn't be engaged in climate disinformation. But these big oil companies have become very sophisticated. They don't engage directly now in the climate disinformation. They used to in the past just tell outright uh, lies. Now they have a third party group that is doing the campaign to spread mis misinformation, to try to block legislation, to have a fee on methane, or to block climate legislation, uh, ending fossil fuel subsidies. They let the American Petroleum Institute do their advocacy, uh, put out misinformation, and they fund uh, these, uh, these groups. And it's a, a really cynical strategy. The committee released a report detailing some of that strategy. What do you believe are some of the most important takeaways from those millions of documents that you obtained? Uh, the most important takeaway is that these companies still have not come clean. I mean, they were plotting against Sunrise Kids uh, when the Sunrise Movement were uh, was mobilizing uh, and talking about how they could stop these kids from activism. They uh, are continually to mislead the American public now is claiming that they are clean companies and yet devoting a very small fraction of their budget actually to clean technology. They talk about regulating, quote unquote, uh, scope one or scope two emissions, which are basically the emissions coming out of their actual facilities, but not the emissions that are caused by the burning of oil or gas themselves, which is the vast majority uh, of emissions. So it is a these companies are continued to engage in uh, in misinformation, and there was no accountability. Well, what in personal responsibility do I, I drive electric cars? I don't know what you drive, but for people who fly and do burn fossil fuels, isn't there some also personal responsibility? I mean, I understand that there's deception from from the suppliers, but you know, where is what's the responsibility of individuals? Well, I, I think there is obviously some responsibility to, to have carbon offsets or uh, to, to, to live responsibly. But I don't think that this issue is a individual responsibility issue. I mean, where you said, well, let's recycle or let's do small things. This is a systemic issue where you've had certain corporations make billions of dollars uh, on uh, b basically being able to pollute the, 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 the climate. And what we really need is policy, uh, macro policy that is going to change that. The most important thing being massive investments in renewable energies and public transportation. But the second thing being having some price on, on carbon. And if we have that kind of price on carbon, uh, then we don't have these negative externalities. So I, I, I think it's important for all of us to be uh, conscientious, but it's really a societal uh, issue.
Big oil companies like BP are now reducing their promise to reduce emissions given their $27 billion in profits in 2022. Others are also walking back their emission reduction goals as well. They're also doing what the stock market incentivizes them to do, right? They're making profits. That's what they're in the business to do. And that's what, you know, some retirees who own oil and stock companies for their dividends uh, are investing them to do. So what do you say about they're just responding to the market doing what they're supposed to do? Well, first, I say that we need to stop subsidizing them. I mean, the, the U.S. taxpayer shouldn't be giving them the kind of depreciation tax exemptions and uh, tax credits that we do. So we have all these kind of uh, subsidies. Those need to stop. The second thing is that they need to be transparent. It's fine for them to be able to make a, a profit, but they shouldn't be uh, making profits by misleading uh, the American public. Either but there should be an accountability for the past lies that some of these companies have told, and there should be uh, a check on what they're saying about their climate goals and whether they're meeting them. I mean, they have to have uh, transparency. And the third thing is there should not be allowed to have excess profits in, in making an advantage uh, and taking advantage of a war. So a lot of these companies, after we went to war with Ukraine, started to have extraordinary profits in a time of emergency. And that's why I proposed with Sherrod, uh, with Sheldon White House, the uh, windfall profits tax, saying you can't just have these record profits uh, at, at a time where uh, Americans are hurting. Right. And there's been a lot of talk about reducing subsidies. Globally, fossil fuel subsidies were $7 trillion in 2022, or 7% of GDP, according to the IMF. I just want to say that again. 7% of GDP is fossil fuel subsidies. U.S. is one of the biggest offenders, though, you know, politicians live in fear of drivers angry about gas prices. If fossil fuel subsidies go away, there could be some increase in fossil fuel prices. That leads to angry voters, yellow jackets in France, et cetera. Is there our political system really ready for that? Well, one, we could stop the export of oil. We used to have the ban on the export of oil from 1973 to 2015. That would reduce CO2 emission and also would help with gas prices. Second, there are ways of having some price on carbon without uh, having uh, the working class and middle class uh, suffer. You could tax the large uh, corporations and provide a dividend to uh, the working and middle class from that taxation uh, to make sure that the the, the uh, burden is really falling on uh, those who are profiting. And, and I don't think that ending some of these subsidies uh, would really drive up the uh, the the price of uh, gas at the pump. They these companies are making record profits, uh, and the uh, challenge on the price of the pump was the U decisions in Ukraine, the the war in Ukraine, and the the Saudi decision to cut in in OPEC. And that's where we need to be tougher, and that we shouldn't be exporting uh, our our oil. I interviewed a, a board member of ConocoPhillips earlier this year, and he would say actually that oil companies are not very good at making money while they have some years, like 2022, eye-popping profits. There are some years they lose a lot of money, and critics of the industry off, off, often look at the profitable years and ignore the, the, the years where they lose money. And over time, you know, this is Arjun Murthy, he's on the board of ConocoPhillips, says actually oil companies are not so good at making money. So, you know, are you cherry-picking your time frame there? And if you look broadly, um, they're not, they don't make as much money. You know, they make a lot, they lose a lot over time. Well, that's an argument for diversification then of these companies into renewable energy. Uh, and it is a argument for American consumers of why we want to transition to less volatile uh, energy uh, supplies. I mean, we don't want a situation where you've got three bucks gas going up to four, five, six bucks gas and uh, wildly fluctuating profits. So uh, that is an argument for why we shouldn't be subsidizing the uh, oil and gas industry and should be uh, having more investment in uh, renewable energy. So what's happening now? You're in the minority. Republicans are uh, in control of the House. They have a very different agenda. They've got this uh, was a project 2025 looking at setting an agenda for a Republican agenda if they win the White House next year. So what, what's how is the energy uh, landscape shifted now that you're in the minority and Republicans are in charge of the House? Well, there's no attention to the climate. I mean, my committee was disbanded. The committee I chaired where we had the historic uh, hearings uh, on big oil now no longer exists. It's now called the Energy Subcommittee, where the, the goal is just to see uh, how you can have 
unimpeded support for the big oil and gas uh, industry. So there is no talk about emissions. There's no talk about the 162 uh, million uh, g- g- greenhouse gases that are emitted every every day. Uh, it is just uh, a, a denial of, of climate. You represent Silicon Valley. You know, your family traces back to, to India. There's been horrific heat impacts in India. We've seen what happened in Maui, uh, the Canadian wildfires. Um, how have you personally experienced the impacts of climate change uh, from from Pakistan around the world? It seems like every every day we open the paper, there's something happening. Well, the, it, the uh, impacts haven't just been international. They've been local. I mean, obviously, the wildfires in California have been uh, awful. The smoke in Washington, D.C. from the Canadian wildfires has been devastating. I have had people I know in Vermont and New Hampshire who've had flooding. And then it's just been heartbreaking to see what's happened in uh, Hawaii. And you point out that there are drought conditions in uh, in other parts of the world. And this is going to hurt particularly farmers and our ability to produce enough food uh, in uh, different parts of the world. So Climate change is already taking place. We're seeing the consequences. And the real question is, do we are we finally going to have the will to act? I mean, I was very disappointed with the decision to have the Willow Pipeline, which is the, one, the largest uh, oil uh, project on public land. I mean, that is just a punch to the gut for those of us who believe that we need to be investing in renewable energy and transitioning uh, away from uh, an entrenched fossil fuel future. On Climate One Today, a conversation with Democratic Congressman Ro Khanna. If you missed a previous episode or want to hear more of Climate One's empowering conversations, subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your pods. You can help us get more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or a review. You can do it right now from your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. On our new website, you can create and share playlists focused on any topic. Coming up... Young voters are demanding politicians do more to address the climate crisis. They're right to be angry at Washington and not uh, doing enough to recognize the climate crisis or to uh, take the types of action we, we, we need, which is to end the fossil fuel subsidy, declare a climate emergency, stop drilling on public lands. That's up next. In March, the Biden administration approved a controversial oil drilling project in Alaska's National Petroleum Reserve known as the Willow Project. The approval caused a significant outcry among climate and environmental activists. Yeah, people were really upset about this decision. And the Biden administration claimed that its hands were tied because ConocoPhillips, the company behind the Willow Project, had already purchased the right to drill in that area. Right, and Joe Biden was elected to restore the rule of law. Still, environmentalists say this commits us to burning more fossil fuels at a time when we need to burn less. But recently, the administration made the decision to permanently ban oil and gas drilling on 10 million acres in the reserve, and it plans to cancel seven leases that the previous administration issued for the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Which means the administration is doing what it said it could not do when it approved Willow. Let's get back to my conversation with Congressman Ro Khanna, who is a vocal critic of the Willow Project. The president ran on saying no new drilling on public lands, no new oil drilling there. The Conoco could have taken the administration to court and uh, the authority may have been challenged and we could have seen how it would have resolved. But there was no reason uh, for the administration, for the Department of Interior to approve that it was a mistake. Right. And, and there, but there is definitely a, a shift. You think that the uh, Biden administration is worried. What I've heard is they have a problem with young voters who turned out for him in 2020. And they look at Will and say, I'm not, you know, there's already an enthusiasm gap for Joe Biden. Uh, is administration, are you concerned about young climate conscious voters turning out in 24? I am. They they really were disappointed with the Willow Project. They really were disappointed with Mountain Valley Pipeline, which is a shame because the Inflation Reduction Act was such a win, such a win for climate. The fact that the president is trying to create the uh, Climate Civilian Corps uh, through executive order is a win for climate. But these moves were 
uh, really unforced errors. And they sent a very disheartening message to young activists. And when I meet young activists, it's one of the first things they bring up. And so we need to address it. And I'm glad the administration is taking corrective action. You mentioned young activists. There's a group called Climate Defiance. And we've seen recently people gluing themselves to airplane runways, you know, disrupting, even going after Democrats, you know, governor of Massachusetts, et cetera. Uh, I saw a, a video on you know, Instagram or TikTok where they actually uh, were more friendly toward you. There's a growing, somewhat radical youth protest movement because they're scared and they don't see a change happening. How do you see that Climate Defiance group and those kinds of more confrontational protests, even going after Democrats? Well, I respect them. I mean, they're nonviolent protests. So obviously, I don't agree with anything that crosses the line into uh, violence or vandalism. But the climate defiance has been perfectly peaceful. They're, uh, all they're doing is disrupting uh, a speech or a hearing to make their point. And they're right to be angry at Washington and not uh, doing enough to recognize the climate crisis or to uh, take the types of action we, we, we need, which is to end the fossil fuel subsidy, declare a climate emergency, stop drilling on public lands. Uh, these are uh, very common sense demands that uh, a lot of the young folks have. Uh, and they're frustrated that we haven't been able to do that even with uh, a Democratic administration. Right. The president says he effectively has uh, declared a climate emergency, though that doesn't unlock kind of the emergency powers. But, you know, some of those people that are being targeted by young protesters say, hey, we're the good guys. We're doing as much as we can, you know, within the constraints that we have, you know, uh, because we have to worry about, I don't know, swing voters, uh, uh, suburban women in 24 who don't want prices to go up or are, are more moderate. Do you recognize the line the administration is trying to walk there uh, looking at the whole political landscape and, and swing moderate suburban voters? No, because I think one of the things the climate emergency would allow them to do is put a ban on uh, exporting oil, which is a Richard Nixon policy in 1973 and which we had until 2015. And the reason that was overturned was a, basically a handout to big oil companies to be able to export uh, this oil for pro massive profits. And that is increasing the export, uh, the climate carbon footprint but it's also raising the price of gas because we're selling it on a global market instead of domestically. So uh, I, I believe there are solutions that both are good for American consumers and also good for the climate. The Willow Project had nothing to do with swing voters. All of that, uh, even by ConocoPhillips, would be used for export. It's not going to help reduce the price, and it's years and years down the line. Uh, so m my sense is that uh, these are areas where we wouldn't be losing swing voters and could be standing with the climate activists. In the first half of 2023, the U.S. became the world's largest exporter for liquefied natural gas. Now a massive new LNG export terminal called CP2 is proposed for the Louisiana coast. Uh, Bill McKibben wrote about this in The New Yorker. It would have 20 times the lifetime emissions of the Willow Project underway in the Arctic that you mentioned. The U.S. Department of Energy is expected to approve or deny an expanded export permit for CP2 this fall. What's at stake and what should the Biden administration do? It would be a big mistake for them to approve a carte blanche export license there. This is, uh, as Bill McKibben writes, the fight for like Keystone, the Keystone Pipeline. And young activists are already uh, paying attention to this. It's one thing to have some liquefied natural gas going to our European allies in a time where we have a war in Ukraine. But we don't need something that's going to have this 20 times uh, if impact. And it's a horrible message on... Uh, reducing emissions. What the climate activists are saying is it's not enough just to have investments in electric vehicle battery plants and investments in uh, solar and wind, that we can't continue to entrench and build new fossil fuel infrastructure and expect that CO2 emissions are going to go down or that we're going to make any dent in the 162 million uh, number of uh, greenhouse gas particles that we emit every day. 
Right. Though some would say that's really investors' problem, whether they're going to invest in that facility or not. Investors might lose money if that gas becomes uh, unburnable or markets there. Is it really the government to say, you know, tell people whether they're going to win or lose on, on bets? Granted, the International Energy Agency has said, we don't need more fossil fuel infrastructure. We don't need to discover more. There's already enough fossil fuels on the balance sheets of these big companies to fry our home. So it does seem to be kind of insanity to continue doing it. But isn't that the choice of, of companies in a free market to do it? Well, it would be the choice of uh, companies if it was appropriately priced, but the companies are b- bearing the gains of uh, selling the liquefied natural gas or the oil uh, without the costs of the harm they're doing to the environment and all of us. And that's because there's no price on carbon. And so if there were Uh, an appropriate price, then you'd have a functional market, but you don't. And that's why the government has to step in. And this president has said that uh, he did not want more public drilling, uh, drilling on public lands. Uh, I'm not sure on the CP2 if that's in private land or public land, but the administration should be taking actions to uh, stop further entrenching uh, fossil fuel infrastructure that is clearly destructive to uh, the environment. Senator Joe Manchin, uh, who was frustrated a lot of people in his own party uh, in sort of scaling down and, and shaping the what became the Inflation Reduction Act. You say that there's a place for Joe Manchin in, in, in the Democratic Party. How do you approach him and other Democrats from fossil fuel states? You know, Robert Byrd before him, John Tester's facing a tough fight in Montana. You know, how do you, you're part of the Progressive Caucus in the House. How do you um, see moderate Democrats who are in perhaps a different place? on fossil fuels and climate than you are? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that the voters get to decide who to send up here, and we've got to work with who comes here to make progress. And that's why for almost a year, I was the only one Democrat uh, in meetings with Joe Manchin in bipartisan meetings saying whatever is going to come in the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, Manchin's going to have to sign off. That was just the reality. And when a lot of other people uh, in the progressive world and the House, even some in the White House had written him off, I was there uh, at some criticism from my left uh, saying, no, we've got to work with him. We've got to figure out how to do it. And I give Senator Schumer immense credit for pulling that deal together. And where I say I played some role is then to get progressives to uh, help uh, support uh, that uh, deal that that Schumer and Manchin came up with. Had we not done that, we wouldn't have had any of the Inflation Reduction Act. So uh, I do believe we have to work in the system we have to make progress. And that's why I often uh, described as sort of a progressive who's reasonable or wants to c- compromise to get things done. I One more point, we have to have massive investment in places like West Virginia, places that are uh, are traditionally fossil fuel states in new industry, disproportionate investment to incentivize them uh, for making this kind of a transition. As we record this, President Biden's joining a UAW picket line in Michigan. Uh, Donald Trump is going there tomorrow. We have this kind of interesting theater with presidents joining uh, UAW uh, striking workers on strike against GM and Stellantis, the owner of Dodge and Jeep. Ford you know, seems to be on a, on a path toward some kind of deal a little bit to the side here now. But you know, workers are concerned about EVs that require fewer workers to build, fewer parts fewer mechanics to take care of them. So how do you address the the organized labor demands and the real concerns about this transition to electric vehicles and job security? Well, I was out there in Wayne, Michigan and Toledo, Ohio with the United uh, Auto Workers, and I'm uh, proud of them standing up for uh, fair wages. And it's wonderful, actually, in this country that we have a president and former president both rushing uh, and eager to, to go there. I mean, I believe President Biden has done a lot more actually for workers, but it just shows the sympathy that America has uh, for the workers. Here's what I'd say about electric vehicles. Obviously, it takes less uh, auto workers to make an electric vehicle. And even if you factor in the battery plant and the supply chains, it's still probably less. But the reality is electric vehicles are going to exist. They're a percentage of the global market. 
Uh, we can debate whether they're going to be 50 percent, 30 percent, 20 percent, 10 percent. No one really knows. But there's certainly going to be a significant percentage. You yourself said you have an electric vehicle. So the, then the question becomes, should those electric vehicles be made in the United States or in China? And my view is they should be made in the United States and they should have good union jobs that, yes, if you want to make internal combustion engines while those are being made, those are good jobs. So the new jobs for this new market should be American jobs and uh, pay well. And that's the debate with UAW. At the heart of the debate is, should these battery plants, should the electric vehicle supply chain be unionized? I believe it should. Right. Though a lot of the investment, as you know, is going to the southeast and right to work states and the Biden administration through Inflation Reduction Act tried to have some domestic content rules, labor rules, et cetera. But the reality is that, uh, you know, even Ford and some of these uh, U.S. companies are moving to the southeast where there's uh, unions that are, if not outlawed, make it very difficult. That's just where the industry is going. Right. And there's a concern that this strike could make Ford and Stellantis are unionized cars less competitive against uh, other companies. Well, the master agreement would cover those plants in for, in Kentucky, in Tennessee, in the South, and that's why it's important that they get the master agreement, the U- UAW. In terms of the competitiveness, I mean, you have record profits for the big three. You've got CEOs that are making $30 million a year. You've got $5 billion in stock buyback. So it's hard uh, for these companies to plead poverty or competitiveness when the workers took massive cuts in 2008 and still haven't been made whole. And people see these record profits of these companies. I do believe the administration sh- should have had more safeguards to, to make sure that if you're going to get taxpayer money, there needs to be the right to organize. There need to be uh, prevailing wages. Are you concerned about, say, partnering with companies from China, as, as Ford has done? I am, especially if the labor standards aren't being met uh, and if the uh, the workers aren't getting uh, fair wages. I mean, uh, there are also alternative companies that uh, Ford and other uh, companies can look at. Look, w- w- there are two competing issues. One is how do we have uh, as strong and robust a green transition? And the other is how do we have workers paid appropriately and with dignity? And I don't think that in the rush to just try to achieve one goal, we can overlook the other goal. Because if you don't have workers buy-in, then you're not going to get uh, the support, public support for the clean policies, clean energy policies. And Sean Fain and I wrote an op-ed saying the two big challenges of our time are income inequality and uh, the climate crisis. We need to tackle both. The Gen Z for change groups, the uh, young voters on climate recognize that. If you go to their social media pages, you'll see some of the strongest support from Gen Z voters for the UAW workers. The largest EV manufacturer in the world is Tesla, whose first factory is in your district. The California Department of Fair Housing and Employment sued Tesla last year, alleging discrimination against black workers who are severely underrepresented in the ranks of executives, senior officials, and managers. Companies faced other litigation regarding worker safety. As a person who represents Tesla workers, presumably who live around that Fremont factory, how concerned are you about Tesla and and its place in this ecosystem and its labor practices? Well, when I was in the Obama administration, I had advocated for the unionization at Tesla. I said we should be conditioning the Treasury Department funding uh, to allowing Tesla workers to unionize. And I was outspoken about that, and I have remained outspoken about it. And it is uh, uh, unfortunate that uh, the Tesla workforce isn't unionized. It's uh, a, a real concern in this electric vehicle transition. Legacy auto auto companies and even oil and gas companies have more diverse workforces than some of the solar and the, quote, clean energy companies. So where is the U.S. making progress on that front, bringing uh, workers, you know, workers of color into this new economy so that they're not left behind? President Biden you know, has this Justice 40 initiative trying to put a lot of placement on that. Where do you think it's, it's happening and, and where does more work need to be done? Well, we need to make sure that these funds uh, that are going from the IRA are going to places that are uh, union-friendly towns, that are going to communities of color, and and the investments are going into uh, cities that uh, have large, diverse populations, and that we have to be intentional uh, about that, and we need to be intentional in the funds uh, for workforce training and have metrics in, in measuring that 
so that we don't just have all of this funding go uh, without any concern about the geography or the inclusivity of the support. Coming up, what would a Green New Deal for health mean for victims of climate disasters? We need to have uh, that kind of a infrastructure so that when there are climate emergencies, people can get the, the health care that they need. We don't have that. We didn't have that with the flooding in Vermont. We didn't have that with the emergency that we saw in Hawaii. That's up next. The Inflation Reduction Act is the biggest energy and climate bill this country has ever passed. It's a huge bill, and success will depend on implementation, how the money moves out to people and states. In my conversation with Congressman Ro Khanna, I asked him what the law gets right and where it could be improved. It was a historic uh, investment. I mean, the largest investment ever. I think it does an incredible job in getting solar and wind and electric vehicle and battery plants off the ground in the United States. What it needs to improve is more labor checks so that the money shouldn't have just been going without conditions for allowing the right to unionize, allowing for prevailing wage. Uh, and there's needs to be more scale of the investment. I mean, to put it in context, it's $300 billion over 10 years. Our defense budget in the same time will be close to uh, eight or nine trillion dollars. So it's an investment, but it still uh, dwarfs the investments we're making in our military uh, when climate the climate crisis is a huge existential threat. Uh, and we need to have more investment in public transportation and also ending the fossil fuel subsidies and taking policy so we aren't just entrenching new uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, which the Inflation Reduction Act didn't really address. Implementation of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, is going to be critical to meeting U.S. emission reduction goals, about 43 percent the EPA believes the law is capable of. But what are some of the obstacles or barriers you see to implementing uh, the IRA? Because certainly there are Republican governors who <laughs> they've, uh, and others who may not be so invested in the success of it. One is the workforce. I mean, we need to have uh, uh, training and, and uh, investment in making uh, sure that we have the workforce to be able to do all the new uh, industrialization that is there. Second is to make sure that the wages are good and that people have the right to organize and bargain so that these new jobs are considered good jobs, not just a numerical job, but a job that can be family supporting uh, for the, the middle class. Uh, and third, uh, that there is a, a, a accountability and that we're uh, monitoring the timelines of these projects and not getting delayed in bureaucracy and red tape uh, so that uh, the American people know we're capable of doing big things. I mean, the Empire State Building most famously was built in a year. And there was a sense at, uh, at a one point in time that America could do big things fast. Uh, we've got to have that same kind of urgency uh, when uh, Governor Shapiro uh, got I-95 correctly built after uh, the, the huge storm in a few weeks. There was such a national pride uh, because we weren't used to that. And, and we need to be able to do that at the federal level. Utah Republican John Curtis is chair of the Conservative Climate Caucus in the House. He's less concerned about getting all fossil fuels than I am. And we had a good conversation recently on this show. Uh, do you talk to him? Do you think you can find common ground with uh, conservatives and other Republicans on energy and climate? It's been hard on climate. I mean, I talked and work with Republicans all the time. I work with Nancy Mace on child care. I work with uh, Marco Rubio on economic development. I guess one place there is possible common ground is on the steel bill that I'm talking about, the build new steel plants in America on national security. And it just so happens that those things will have a lower carbon footprint. But if you lead with the Republicans with let's lower carbon footprints, they'll probably walk away. If you say let's produce things in America, build things in America, they may be open to it. And then it turns out the new technology is better on CO2 emissions. The other place is clean air, clean water. Let's get PFAS out of uh, the uh, out of communities. Those uh, arguments also uh, can appeal sometimes to more Republican leaning voters and uh, members of Congress who come from a tradition of uh, sometimes uh, stewardship of the land, stewardship of the air, uh, from a faith tradition. I mean, my faith in per terms of my Hindu faith is uh, a, a 
uh, is certainly one of respect for the world and planet we live in and all living organisms, that there is a divinity to that. And other faith traditions have the same kind of reverence for the land and the water uh, and our obligation to it. And that is a language that uh, sometimes finds common ground with Republicans. I think language is key and often a barrier that let me use di- that language would be some coded, you know, you could do a lot about climate if you don't use the, that C word and use other words. Well, I talk about uh, production and new industrialization and the opportunity to build new things, because those are uh, values that many Americans have, that Republicans have too. I talk about being stewards of the land and stewards of the the the, the planet that we've inherited and responsible stewards uh, uh, about it. I talk about clean air and clean water and healthy communities, which we uh, all want. I also acknowledge that uh, it, it, that that there's genuine room for debate. That you can't. That a lot of times these are values issues, and you can't just have scientists have the last word. A lot of time, what we're debating is uh, is the probability risk of some really bad consequence uh, worth uh, avoiding, uh, and the cost of it maybe uh, is some economic. Uh, short-term tax or short-term uh, cost. And that's a values question. It's not simply a scientific question. And a lot of times I think when the other side, when you uh, disguise a values question for a scientific question and and call people ignorant of science when really they're expressing a desire for different values, it's not as persuasive. And it actually has the perverse uh, perverse consequences of politicizing science. So a lot of times my view is we should be debating the values uh, and not just hiding behind the science. A lot of that was COVID. I mean, I was very much for masking and I was for uh, a a shutdown when it happened, but those were values decisions. Those were the same sense saying, I'm comfortable with those decisions uh, and and that trade-off. It wasn't just a scientific question. That's different than we often what we often hear from the left, which is, you know, march on science, defend science. The reality is most Americans don't know a scientist, don't ever talk to a scientist, don't particularly like or fondly remember high school chemistry and physics. So you're saying talk about values. Science is important, but don't lead with science, which is um, a lot of climate conversations. People are waving that climate stick. Well, this comes from the the, the, the sense of how do we understand uh, science in a democracy. Of course, we need more scientific literacy. Of course, we need more climate literacy in our schools, and people should have that. But we uh, run the risk of politicizing science when we lead with the scientists. Instead, scientists should be experts that people can look to, but there should be a, a recognition of, 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 of values. And uh, the, then we can make the argument about why we, uh, we should care about these issues. The Biden administration recently issued a directive requiring the U.S. federal government, which purchases $600 billion in goods and services annually, to include the social cost of carbon in construction, purchasing, and other activities. This is kind of a wonky number, uh, but it's basically some of the extra externalities we were talking about earlier, the social cost. Biden has set the new number reportedly close to $190 a ton, more than four times what it was in the Obama years. So how important is this social cost of carbon, and how do you explain it? to people because it's kind of hard to follow. It's a big step by the president. Sheldon Whitehouse, the senator from Rhode Island, has been pushing this for years. And uh, all it says is that when you're doing business with the federal government, we should look at what the actual cost of uh, what you're selling is. And that's not just the price you're charging, but it's also the carbon that you're emitting uh, into the atmosphere. And the federal government has huge influence because we're a big purchaser of goods and services. And so if we can help uh, incentivize people to lower their carbon footprint, uh, that can have a dramatic impact on CO2 emissions in the United States. In April of 2023, you and Senator Ed Markey introduced the Green New Deal for Health. Uh, Green New Deal is kind of a rallying cry. It seemed to be not really uh, active policy inside Washington. Can you explain what the Green New Deal for health contains and and why you're proposing it now? So all the Green New Deal 
means, as I understand it, is that we need massive reindustrialization and development in the United States that can lower the carbon footprint and that there's this opportunity as we have to make the new steel, new aluminum, new cement uh, to do so in processes that will actually lower the carbon footprint and create jobs. With the Green New Deal for Health, it actually was a bit prescient. We did it in April of 2023, and then you had the awful, heartbreaking tragedy in uh, Maui, and you saw the need uh, for healthcare systems and emergency response systems to be adaptive to climate emergencies. We don't have that. We didn't have that with the flooding in Vermont. We didn't have that with the emergency that we saw uh, in Hawaii. We didn't have it uh, fully in uh, the storms we saw in Florida. So this is uh, just saying that we need to have uh, that kind of uh, a infrastructure so that when there are climate emergencies, people can get the, the health care that they need. Right. And, and those costs are just soaring. And we don't seem to sort of uh, people don't personally feel that cost. They think it comes from, I don't know, some uh, uh, Uncle Sam's pockets somehow that's not related to their taxes. You know, how long can the, the federal government continue to to run to the rescue of, of these disasters that are happening with increased intensity and frequency? Well, that's uh, exactly the point of why we need the climate investment, because if we don't have uh, these investments, the costs of these uh, catastrophes are going to be far more. Now, people say, well, even if we do it, what about China? What about India? What about the rest of the world? Well, America will lead. We always have led. And that lead, leading uh, shapes the markets, shapes the behavior of other countries, especially if we end up including uh, a carbon tax at the border. Uh, we can really shape global markets uh, to uh, reduce global emissions. Uh, we are the largest uh, economy in the world, and especially working with Europe, we can have that kind of impact. And speaking of the global impacts of this, uh, climate is obviously a global issue. Uh, Vladimir Putin has weaponized fossil fuels in his invasion of Ukraine. You referenced that earlier. Republicans have gone squishy on supporting the Ukrainian people, defending their homeland, and public support for U.S. funding is softening. The AI tools and deep fakes are much more sophisticated than they were in the 2016 election. Is that on your radar, the, this potential, what some people, Scott Galloway, a podcaster I listen to and others have said, there's a coming wave of Russian disinformation on oil and gas motivated by Ukraine and aimed at the U.S. election. I'm very concerned about uh, Russian disinformation. I'm concerned about Chinese disinformation. When I was in Taiwan, uh, there was so much concern about Chinese propaganda, and uh, there's going to be concern about Russian propaganda in uh, the United States. And that's why we need to have some rules adopted by Congress about the use of deep fakes, about the use of AI for propaganda and disinformation. Uh, and we need our federal agencies, FTC, FEC, to try to have those rules before 2024. Uh, I fear we can't barely keep the government open, uh, that it's going to be hard uh, to come to that consensus with Republicans who may have an incentive uh, in doing anything to aid the Trump campaign. But we really need to have some rules of accountability. So as we look forward, you know, we're concerned about, concern about Russian disinformation, uh, energy and this clean transition is going to be very much at the center of the election, as we've seen by Donald Trump and Joe Biden going to Michigan this week. You know, how do you think that um, energy is going to play out in the 2024 election? We are going to have new energy sources in the world. That is obvious. The question is, will America lead in them? Or are we going to say, well, we just want to lead in oil and gas and let China and other countries lead in the new energy sources? That has never been the American way. That would be like saying, well, we should just continue to lead in the analog world and let China lead in technology. What a colossal mistake that would have been. I want America to lead in the clean energy race. I want those jobs to be good paying union jobs or high paying jobs in communities. And I want us to uh, help reindustrialize, reinvigorate this country's economic prosperity with this opportunity that uh, we made a mistake by hollowing out our middle class, working class industrial base. Now we have this opportunity to rebuild it in a way that has a lower carbon footprint. Let's take this opportunity not just to tackle climate, but to uh, transform the economy in a way that's going to uplift people like the UAW auto workers uh, who are striking. Uh, and that's why that strike is so critical 
these new EV jobs, these new solar jobs, these new climate jobs have to be good paying jobs and they have to be at least as good as the old jobs. And a lot of those jobs are happening in red districts, uh, even perhaps uh, represented by members of Congress who voted against that. But there is going to be a significant effort to to repeal, to claw some of that back. What are you most concerned about losing in the IRA if it gets you know rolled back? I'm most concerned about uh, losing some of the uh, tax incentives for uh, electric vehicles that could just shut down or reverse the market. I'm concerned about losing the funding for new solar and wind plants. I'm concerned about uh, losing the uh, incentives to invest in new clean technology. Uh, and and that if we had that happen, if we had uh, Donald Trump come and, uh, and, and had a Republican House and Senate, and that was set back, it could set us back decades because the clean tech investors in the private sector will say, we can't trust Washington. They do one thing and then they take it away. Let's stay away from this industry. So that's really what's at stake. That's what I tell my friends, my younger climate activist friends who, whose frustrations I share about Willow and Mountain Valley Pipeline and uh, the expansion of oil drilling in the IRA uh, and who, who I believe are right to be demanding climate emergency. I say, the stakes are too high to move backwards. Uh, we have had progress. We finally have climate front and center in Washington. Uh, we need to build on that progress. Congressman Ro Khanna, thanks for coming on Climate One today and sharing your insights. We appreciate it very much. Thank you. Really appreciate your having me. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate challenge. To hear more, subscribe wherever you get your pods. Let's face it, talking about climate is sometimes hard, but also sometimes exciting and really interesting. Please help us get people talking more about climate because it's critical for the transitions we need to make throughout society. You can help us get more people to listen to the show by giving us a rating or a review, or share a particular episode like this one with a friend. By sharing, you can help people have their own deeper climate conversations. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Ariana Brocious is co-host, editor, and producer. Austin Colon is producer and editor. Our production manager is Megan Basilia. Wincy Shada is our development manager. And Ben Testani is our communications manager. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton. <laughs>